So then we can start with uh, the first uh, panel uh, session. And before going into that, just to say that for all present here in the room, there will be, after each um, uh, opening discussions in the, in the panels, uh, introductory remarks by panelists, there will also be at some stage um, um, room for interaction. So don't hesitate to have questions ready, uh, which you may want to ask to the panelists. But first, uh, I would like um, to introduce to you, uh, moving to the discussion on the significance on the independence of uh, the profession, the legal profession, in the administration of justice, um, to introduce to you uh, our first moderator of today, Berit Reis Andersen. Um, she has been a lawyer, an author, a politician who has served as president of uh, the Norwegian Nobel Committee since 2014. She is also the former Norwegian Minister of Justice and the Police and former president of the Norwegian Bar Association. It is an immense honor uh, for us to have you here, Berit, so I look forward to your panel session and if I may ask you and the panelists to come. Well, everyone in place. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the title of our panel is not intuitively understandable. What is the significance of an independent legal profession for the administration of justice? I think we will be speaking about the role of the lawyer and the standard of independency. Why is it important and what does it in fact consist of? Um, I have the honor of having three very high level panelists with me. All three of you are lawyers and have a very distinguished legal career. But when I read through your bios, I also see that you have used your professional training, so to speak, for a higher purpose to uh, serve society. And I'm, I'm very happy that you took the time to come here and join us today. Um, our first speaker is sitting at my right. David Villas, Director General for International Legal Cooperation and Human Rights, uh, and um, representing the Spanish Presidency, and being instrumental in suggesting and carrying out new policies uh, and identifying new policies in the Spanish Presidency period. And I like the details, and I see that you studied in Santiago de Compostela, one of the most beautiful cities of Europe, where you took your law degree. Uh, you have um, experience as a state attorney, but I think it is fair to say that your dominant background is in several administrative institutions, also European institutions, and that you also lecture on administrative law. So this entire area, how we regulate and organize our societies is the background for your um, legal um, uh, professional career. And then I have the honor to my left, um, Monsieur Didier Reinders, um, uh, who also uh, uh, has been a commissioner of is has been a commissioner of justice since 2019, and you have a distinguished legal career, but also a very strong political career. And I mention only a few of the very many positions you have held. You have been minister of trade 
Finance, you've been Minister of Foreign Affairs, European Affairs, and you have been Deputy Prime Minister. So in your person itself, policy, politics and law meet, and we are very much looking forward to listen to your experience. And then, last but not least, um, to my far right, Michael of Flattery. Is that the correct pronunciation? <laughs> Almost. <laughs> um, uh, director of EU Agency for Fundamental uh, Rights. And um, I will have to say, we have a very distinguished human rights expert with us. You have been a long time professor of human rights law and director of the Irish um, Centre for Human Rights at the National University uh, of Ireland. And you have also worked with the United Nations, both on the Un uh, Human Rights Committee and several uh, United Nations field operations. Um, so, you really know human rights in theory and in practice. Uh, you are a doctor of law, but I, again, there was a detail that intrigued me that you also have degrees in international relations, philosophy and theology. And I think perhaps the philosophical aspect here also have some interest what is really the core value of, of uh, the independency and uh, the secrecy uh, um, of the profession. And um, I see that the slogan for your institution, FRA, is helping to make fundamental rights a reality for everyone in the European Union. And I think that can be a good slogan for our panel at large. And then uh, it's my pleasure to give the word to Mr. David Villas to give some opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, very, very kind, Joe Walsh. Excellencies and distinguished uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let, let me start by thanking to CCB for inviting not me uh, indeed, but the Spanish rotating presidency of the Council of the Union uh, to this significant event. On behalf of the Spanish Minister of Justice, Mrs. Pilar Job Cuenca, I would like to convey to you her apologies for not being able to attend this panel today with such distinguished speakers, which were in Luxembourg last Friday in the GHA Council with me as well. <laughs> it's a kind of uh, mandatory introduction uh, let me briefly share with you the main lines upon which the Spanish presidency unfolds. Some of them are linked with uh, the topic today I will uh, try to speak about uh, afterwards. Uh, in the field of justice, we are trying to focus on measures aimed at consolidating a citizen-centred justice system that responds to citizens' needs, in particular of those in vulnerable situations. We prioritize the sustainability and digitalization of justice, uh, key aspects for public justice services to be accessible, friendly, and respond to their true purpose, a more equitable society through the protection and safeguarding of citizens' rights and the guarantee of democratic values, which still can be further reinforced, and which is uh, fully aligned with the idea of introducing among those citizens just to access easily to the, justice, the administration of justice lawyers as well. We are concentrating our efforts, uh, looking for agreements with the European Parliament on several legislative files as well. Uh, given the unusual number of dossiers that we have on the table in the justice sector for an end of legislature. In criminal matters, uh, negotiations with the European Parliament are ongoing on four directives protection of the environment by criminal law, asset recovery and confiscation, definition of criminal offenses and penalties for the violation of the union restrictive measures, and fight against violence against women and domestic violence. 
Negotiations on a fifth one on prevention and fight against trafficking in human beings are about to start this month. And in civil matters, negotiations with the European Parliament are ongoing on the proposal for a directive regarding abusive civil claims against public participation, SLAP, and about to start precisely today on the proposals for a directive on common rules on civil liability for defective products. This list is not exhaustive. It's a huge amount of uh, topics over the table, and it's not that easy just to uh, search to look for a different room to uh, uh, another topics different to these ones, which are really important in order just to finish uh, properly the legislature. Uh, let me just recall, in any case, at a technical level, we are also working on a wide range of subjects, such corruption, protection of victims of crime, protection of vulnerable adults, insolvency proceedings, parenthood, assignment of claims, GDPR. Many of them are linked with uh, the legal profession as well, of lawyers, uh, in a way. Likewise, we are further promoting the digitalization of cross-border judicial cooperation and working towards the accession of the European Union to the European Convention of Human Rights. In this regard, let me recall that last Friday, Justice Ministers adopted the Council conclusions on digital empowerment to protect and enforce fundamental rights. It is one of the first milestones of our presidency in the field of justice, uh, but we are confident that many more will come in the next months. In these conclusions, the Council of the European Union invites member states to pay attention to the initial and continuing training given to law enforcement and legal practitioners, focusing on further promoting a culture based on the rule of law and fundamental rights, extending the digitalization of justice and supporting the development of digital professional skills in line with the European Judicial Training Strategy for 2021-2024. European judicial training is crucial, uh, but lawyers in particular play a vital role in the practical implementation of the European law in legal proceedings, whether national or cross-border, and consequently, they have to keep up to date with the development of European law as well. But now, secondly, let me focus on the topic we have over the table more properly, the independence of the legal profession and its significance uh, for the administration of justice. As a Spanish presidency, me personally, probably because my background as well, we have no doubt at all, because uh, daily practice has shown us that lawyers are also instrumental in the defense of the values upon which the European Union is founded. Respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, uh, and respect for human rights is laid down in Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union. And we know that quite well in Spain, uh, we could say as well that, uh, for example, the Council of Judiciary in our case is composed by 12 judges and eight lawyers, or other just of recognized competence, something which comes from our constitution. And the General Council of Spanish Lawyers knows very well, as well uh, too. Some of its contributions appear in the last chapter of the rule of law report related with Spain. So they are just working together in order just to improve the rule of law uh, all around Europe and Spain as well. That, uh, this is one reason why we share the mentions made by the Commission in its Rule of Law Report 2023, where two aspects are underlined when we are talking about the independence of lawyers, the right of access to a lawyer and the confidentiality lawyer-client, uh, which is one of the topics of the next panels as well, and where many steps forward are described all around Europe. We also share the approach uh, of the uh, European Union Justice Scoreboard, another product of the Commission, uh, even when some of uh, which uh, data comes from CPEG. And in particular, it is very interesting from our point of view because its synthetic aim, the figure 65 of this uh, uh, scoreboard, which is precisely about independence of bars and lawyers, and it's based on some criteria we could discuss about uh, if it's the appropriate or not, but in any case, they are there, and uh, we are talking about, for example, the possibility to challenge disciplinary measures against lawyers 
or decisions on access to the profession, the independence of the body initiating and taking decisions on disciplinary measures or authorizing for access to the profession, the independence of the bar from the executive or guarantees for confidentiality of the liar-client relationship. If we look for this figure, probably we will discover that the standard at European level, and we were talking here about European level, we are talking about the framework of the European Union, is quite high. Many member states provide a lot of instruments in order just to guarantee all these um, uh, possibilities to protect the lawyers and their independence. Uh, if we compare probably with other regions, uh, or even with our region out of the European Union, the standards would appear in a lower base, probably. And uh, I will link this with uh, the next idea. Within the Council uh, of the European Union, probably a lot of you know that the French presidency proposed to the Council a debate in the JHC Council uh, of March 2022. Perhaps the fact that the French minister is uh, a lawyer as well could uh, help to uh, propose this discussion. There, the minister expressed the views about the possibility of having a European statute for lawyers guaranteeing independent practice of the profession in order to help to ensure respect for the rule of law. It's true that no clear conclusions were extracted from this discussion and uh, we didn't push uh, for anything else there and I tried not to link both ideas. I mean, perhaps uh, that the reason for that is the highest standard we already have at European level uh, and for sure probably the, the, the will of member states normally just to try to rule things uh, with their own legislation, not necessarily harmonize if, 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 if the need is not uh, that clear. But in any case, in third place, we will remind that unfortunately, despite the relevant role Lawyers, lawyers play in the administration of justice in our countries. So we have seen that some of them have been subject to attacks and violation of their rights, including threats, intimidation, external interference in conducting their professional activities and profes uh, or prosecution. We can perhaps uh, agree that their position in the European Union is better than in, in other regions and countries, but uh, it's true that we have to do something with these attacks and we found, in any case, a way, uh, as different member states, perhaps I'm not talking here as presidency of the Council, but as a Spanish representative, because we have the Council of Europe as well. And as uh, we have seen, perhaps there's no large room to work in the European Union about these matters right now, but against this background, we will come to the initiative taken in 2020 by the Council of Europe with a view to ensure an adequate level of protection, we are aware that experts have been working since January 2022 towards the elaboration of a draft convention aimed at strengthening the protection of the legal profession and the right to practice the profession without prejudice and or coercion. They just held their last meeting last week in Strasbourg. We are looking forward to seeing the outcome of their work, but we encourage this work as well as a member state of the Council of Europe as well. So I think that uh, try to restrain myself to the time provided and trying to depict in a general, with a general view of uh, our presidency and how things are more or less uh, in different lives and uh, frameworks in Europe. And uh, this is uh, everything from my side. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Residency, but I didn't hear that much about the significance and independence of lawyers. And that means perhaps that all is well, but uh, I will let you and give you a chance to reflect more on that <laughs> <laughs> uh, a little bit later. For the time being, I will have the honor of addressing the European Commissioner of Justice, Mr. Didier Reiners, and I would like to listen to your opinion of the state of affairs of this field. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks for your uh, introduction. I want just to add that I have studied the law in another beautiful city, uh, Liège, but you will, have maybe the, you will have maybe the opportunity to visit uh, the city later. Now, Mesdames et Messieurs, bonjour, ravi d'être parmi vous. I'm very glad to tackle this subject today. It is a real pleasure. About the uh, uh, significance uh, subject, because when we are speaking about independence uh, in justice field, it's all the time very important, but to have a so independent legal uh, profession in Europe taking part in the administration of justice is also an important uh, element. And lawyers are essential for the promotion of the independence of the justice system, but uh, are more than that and broader than that very important to uh, uh, promote the rule of law in the uh, European Union and abroad. And um, in its ruling, Ord van Vlaams Balis, the European Court of Justice, referring to the case law of the European Court of uh, Human Rights, recalled that lawyers uh, assign a fundamental role in a democratic society. And the rights of defense are, as you know, a key element of the right of a fair trial conferred by the Article 6 of the European Convention of Human Rights, but also equally expressed by Article 47 of the Charter, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, holding that everyone shall have the possibility of being advised, defended, and represented in justice. In the field of criminal procedural law, the right of access to a lawyer has notably been strengthened at the uh, EU level by the adoption of the directive on the right of access to a lawyer and on the right to legal aid. These directives have considerably strengthened the rights of defense uh, in Europe. Many member states adopted important change to their legislation, or I will say uh, are still in the process to do so, so I insist could continue the work and to organize a correct transposition because that's the, the best way to, to go further and to transpose these European rules. Lawyers are often the first interlocutors uh, between citizens and the judicial system. And it's notably thanks to them that justice can be properly administrated. Across the Union, the Commission is therefore following the role of lawyers in its monitoring of the rule of law. And you know one key instrument in the monitoring of the rule of law is since 2020 the rule of law report. I'm very proud it was possible now to publish such a report about the 27 member states and with a very good contribution of all the bar associations but also from your council. And um, we try to describe there in the first chapter the independence, the quality and the efficiency of the justice system. But it was already said in the fourth chapter which was sought to analyze the checks and balances in all the institutional orders in the uh, member states. And there, the civic space is an important element, the role of the civil society organizations, but certainly the role of the lawyers. And we try to extend such uh, an analyse of the role of the lawyers. And the uh, 2023 rule of law report, the Commission highlighted steps to ensure the right of access to a lawyer that are ongoing in several member states. On the other hand, the report underlines that challenges exist in several uh, member states. As for the previous editions or since 2020, the report also stresses that bar associations play an important role in ensuring the independence and professional integrity of lawyers. European standards require that the independence of these associations is ensured. For the preparation of the report, we are uh, all the time in contact with, uh, I said, the bar associations, also with uh, your council, and I must say that we have received very uh, important contributions from the Council of bar, Bars and Law Society in, in Europe and from several bar associations. Of course, we have also a meeting with lawyers in uh, almost all member states because with the rule of law, we part what we try to do is to engage a real dialogue with the member states to try to improve the situation. And in many cases, it's enough. Uh, I will say that following our 2022 report, where for the first time it was possible to uh, send recommendations to the member states, but it was we have seen that uh, 
uh, it was possible to implement two-thirds totally or partially, two-thirds of our recommendations. So there are very good reactions in the member states about that to try to improve the situation. So the dialogue is very important. Not only the dialogue uh, in the European Parliament, in the Council, and we have had again uh, a very important dialogue in Justice Council uh, last week about um, the uh, quality efficiency of the justice system, but also at the national level, with again the national parliament, the, the authorities, but the civil society and certainly the bar associations and other professionals. And what I try to ask to the professionals is to organize, if it's possible, at the national level, some debates about one recommendation, one by one, to discuss with the authorities why it's so easy to implement the recommendations, that's fine, but why it seems to be very difficult sometimes to do that, and why there are so many resistance uh, against uh, the implementation of some recommendations. So the debate at the national level is very important, and certainly also with the professionals. And I will say that in the dialogue that we try to organize, now I try to start a new uh, process with a real um, debate with not only the civil society organizations, the bar associations, but the authorities in the same meeting. We have started in Belgium, then in Germany, and now we try to do that in different places, because that's the best way to have a real contradiction and discussions, and you have in the report very clearly recommendations that it's possible to take on board for those discussions. Of course, that will, uh, at the end, give the opportunity uh, to um, uh, promote and uh, develop a real culture of the rule of law in the member states. I've said also to the Justice Minister last week, I'm very pleased to discuss with the Minister of European Affairs in the Geneva Council. We'll do that during all the different meetings during the Spanish presidency of the Geneva Council. Uh, I will go to Luxembourg and tomorrow we'll discuss about five member states again. Uh, it's very important to do that. But it's very important to do that in the Justice Council, like last week about quality and efficiency of the systems. But I'm dreaming all the time about uh, the possible discussion with the Minister of Education, because I, at the end of all the discussions on the rule of law, democracy, and fundamental rights, everybody is saying the most important element is education, and then everybody is going home. <laughs> and then, why not to discuss with the Minister of Education about the programs? I've seen with um, the president of the Constitutional Courts that it's possible to start very early. Last year, we have started a meeting here in Brussels with all the presidents of the uh, Constitutional Court in Europe. And from Checha, I listened that it's possible to start with children of five years old. Of course, not to discuss about the independence of the lawyers and the organization of the tribunals, but to discuss about the values, how it's possible to fight against discriminations in a classroom for different reasons, and then slowly in the program to go further, and at the end of the program, maybe later, uh, to discuss about the rule of law, democracy, and fundamental rights in detail. But that's very important, because education is of the essence, of course, to promote the culture of the rule of law. If it's impossible to do that with a dialogue, with a real discussion with the member states, of course, uh, when uh, we have a huge problem on the independence of the justice system, we are using other tools, so we are going to the court, or now we are using uh, the budgetary pressure. And uh, you have mentioned my career. I was doing 12 years from the last century uh, <laughs> Minister of uh, Finance in my own country. And I know that for many member states, to read the recommendations in the rule of law report is very impressive. But to know that it's possible to have a suspension of funding of some policies is maybe more impressive. And since uh, the um, end of uh, the COVID period, now we have the capacity in the recovery and resilience plans for all the member states, but also with the conditional mechanism to push pressure on the financial situation of the member states. And we have huge discussions and negotiations about an improvement on, on the member states, also in the uh, usual suspects, I will say, like Hungary and Poland. And so we are doing that. And that's very important also for the lawyers because to protect the independence of the justice system is the best way to have a real chance to have a fair trial in front of a, a judge. So it's very important that you are taking part in the uh, uh, process. I would just to add that we try also to come every year since more than 10 years now with the Justice Core Board 
and you know it's very important to give many indicators about the, the quality and the efficiency of the, the justice system. Um, for example, on efficiency of justice, we are now covering the length of first instance court proceedings on bribery cases. This is the first time we show how efficiently criminal courts are dealing with such cases. On quality on justice, of justice, new figures are available in the scoreboard on access to justice uh, for older persons and for victims of violence against women and domestic violence. And a new figure was introduced which represents the salaries of judges and prosecutors. As regards the independence of justice, a new area is covered in the scoreboard in uh, the fight, as I said, against corruption. And uh, we now present the bodies that work on the prevention, investigation, and prosecution of corruption. Uh, the last report, published in July, contains several indicators showing the powers of these bodies, their specialization, and how their members are appointed. And these indicators show that, although in some member states, the executive branch plays a certain role in monitoring the Bar Association. The independence of lawyers is generally a guarantee. And so we'll continue to monitor, and it was said before, it's very important to do that with, uh, in our mind, also the training of all the professionals. We are doing that from the Commission and uh, the Justice Network for the judge and the prosecutors, but it's very important to do that also with uh, the lawyers. Uh, I will say training on EU law is useful sometimes, but also training on the new tools that we are using in the justice system with the digital evolution that we are knowing now. And strengthen, uh, strengthening the uh, digital skills is very important. And so the recently adopted EU regulation on the digitalization of judicial cooperation and access to justice notably digitalized communication processes. And so training of justice professionals in uh, uh, the um, efficient use of the decentralized IT system provided under this, regu this regulation will be a, a priority. And so I, I want to thank again your council for your participation in, in all those discussions that we have for the rule of law report, for the justice scoreboard, and we'll continue to uh, try to, to work with you, and it's maybe also important for you, we try also to continue to support you financially. Uh, it's maybe useful for, for the council. I'm uh, also grateful for the involvement of your council <coughs> in answering training needs of lawyers from abroad and certainly in the last months from Ukraine. Thanks for that, because we try to work together about the, the training of Ukrainian lawyers and also to uh, uh, go further uh, in the initiative to support the lawyers assisting refugees from uh, Ukraine uh, in the member states. Uh, to this effect, we notably co-finance actions under the HELP program of the Council of Europe on asylum and migration law. And to conclude, of course, we'll continue to uh, uh, monitor the reforms uh, possibly affecting the professional activities of lawyers as well as developments that may touch upon their independence or the proper performance of their duties. And I want to say two words in conclusion. The first in general about justice. Um, we are working, as I said, about efficiency uh, and quality and not only independence. And in many member states, the recommendation in all reports since some years, it's not new, is to uh, uh, invest more in human resources, uh, sometimes in remunerations in the justice system, and certainly in uh, training, uh, when we are speaking about human resources, but also to invest more in digitalization, and we try to help with the recovery and resilience plan. It's very important to, uh, to do that, and I will say again that I have now the opportunity to sit around the table of the Council during my 49th presidency. So I've seen 49th presidency without interruption again since the last century. And I will say in the first presidencies, we discuss about digitalization of the tax administrations. And you have seen maybe in your career that it's possible to work very efficiently with the tax administrations and to have all information with the tax administration online. With the justice systems, it's more and more possible. That depends from one member state to another one. But we have had some delays. 
Maybe because the priority for the member states was to collect taxes before <laughs> to fund different policies. But it's very important that we try to invest more in that because we have a lot of problems in different member states due to a lack of resources invested in the justice system. And the other remarks, we continue to make the difference in many uh, legislative proposals between uh, the activities of the lawyers in the way to organize the right to defend some uh, people accused of different crimes and on different kinds of uh, uh, situations. But uh, we have also, so the other part of the, uh, the activities is the, the advice role uh, for the different people. And of course, we ask to don't take part in criminal activities when you are giving advices. And you know it's a case in money laundering. It's also the case, just to give an example, about the different attempts to circumvent the sanctions against Russia. Uh, there are many oligarchs, many entities trying to circumvent the sanctions, and we try to criminalize that. Of course, we have put an exception for the right to defend. It's normal, but not to the right to give an advice to help different kind of uh, uh, oligarchs to circumvent the sanctions. I want just to say that because we have good relations with the lawyers, but we try so sometimes to be uh, strict about the different behaviors that it's possible to have. But thanks for such an opportunity to explain what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, of course, nobody is advocating the privilege of lawyers to participate in criminal activity. But, uh, thank you so much. Nobody, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, n nobody of responsible organization. <laughs> that's better. That's, better. <laughs> um, that's never been on the policy agenda. Uh, but I thank you for your very comprehensive introduction of the focus points of your office. And it was very interesting when you said that two thirds of your recommendations actually become, uh, get implemented. Um, the one-third that is left reminds us of how politically controversial some of the recommendations of human rights standards, rule of law standards, because everybody pledges to these standards, but when it comes to real-life situation, it's perhaps more challenging. I... Um, have a feeling you might address something related to that, Michael of Flaherty. Why do I have a problem pronouncing your name? Flaherty. Perfect. Flaherty. Perfect. Flaherty. Right. That's yes. right. The, word, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to be here. I feel duty bound to say that I studied law in Dublin, which is a very nice city. <laughs> Um, preparing, preparing for today, I, I, I look back and I thought that I had vaguely been a lawyer for about 30 years. And to my absolute horror, I discovered that I've actually been a lawyer for 40 years. <laughs> and, um, but uh, in those 40 years, and I make the point because for me, the independence of the lawyer has been absolutely axiomatic in my understanding for every one of those 40 years. Uh, and, um, and that it's a core component of the related human rights, for me, is without doubt. We have the jurisprudence, but we also have the logic that we cannot have the right to a fair trial, we cannot have the administration of justice without the independence of lawyers. And uh, when I make these remarks, I do so well aware that I and others stand on the shoulders of giants who have sacrificed their lives and their careers to honour, to defend the independence of the profession. We all have our heroes. I'll just name one. Uh, many of you will know her name, Asma Jahangir of the Pakistan Bar, who uh, sacrificed everything in her life uh, to stand up for the principle. The, um, I think the, the, the experience that Asma had in her life in, at the Pakistan uh, Bar uh, is indicative of what also can go wrong in terms of threats to independence. And working for the UN years ago, uh, I saw directly what a complete absence of independence can do. I saw, I, I have tri monitored trials where there was a collusion between the defense and the prosecution in full uh, coordination with the judge whereby people were found guilty uh, and were led to their executions. 
Now, it's such serious abuse of independence that has triggered uh, such a, an impressive set of standards developed over many decades now, standing up for the independence of lawyers. And I want to mention the standards now because there's a danger when things get a little bit old that they get forgotten, uh, but they remain as valid today as the day they were adopted. 1985, the principles on the independence of the judiciary. 1990, the UN basic principles on the role of lawyers. In the same year, the IBA standards on the independence of the legal profession. And already way back in 1994, the appointment of the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the independence of the judiciary, who has always interpreted the mandate to embrace the independence of lawyers. Here in Europe, we've already heard mention of some very important initiatives. initiatives. There's the rule of law toolbox of the Venice Commission. There's the ongoing drafting work in Strasbourg of a new convention uh, on the protection of lawyers, as we heard just a few moments ago. And there is the work within the European Union. And I won't say much about that now. Commissioner Renders has spoken to it. I just want to take the opportunity in your presence, Commissioner, to say that I know that it's your personal leadership that made this possible. We would not have the new rule of law uh, uh, tools in the European Union were it not for your personal leadership. And I, I think we should all be very grateful to you. So we have, a, we have an impressive arsenal. It will always benefit from being strengthened. Uh, but what is, it being, what is it protecting us against? What are the actual risks to independence? Well, uh, just a few months ago in the summer of this year, the UN Special Rapporteur, the current one, Margaret Satterthwaite, listed seven threats, uh, ongoing threats to independence. She mentioned organized crime and the way it can uh, 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 cast its insidi insidious shadow. She spoke of corruption. Uh, she spoke of abusive invocations by states in some places of states of emergency. She referred to the operation of military tribunals in some jurisdictions. She referred to the, what she describes as the autocratization and democracy decay. Uh, she signalled worries, uh, contemporary worries, about pressures in the context of climate crisis-related litigation. She flagged, obviously, digitalization in two contexts. In the first, the manner in which uh, social media is used to spread disinformation about lawyers. And secondly, then, of course, the encroachment of AI into judicial decision-making. And finally, she flagged a persistent problem of what she describes as elite capture of the legal profession. I think something we all have to face. Maybe we're more willing to do it today than we were until the recent past. Uh, within elite capture, she flagged in some countries gender capture, uh, professions dominated by men. I'm not sure if, that's still, if we can still speak of that in Europe, but it's nevertheless something to think about. And I am a little bit conscious that I'm on an all-male panel here this morning. The, um, one other thing that uh, Satterthwaite flagged, which I think is very interesting in terms of the dimensions of what we need to protect when we protect independence, she referred to the expansion of the profession. She referred to the many non-traditional uh, uh, roles which are of a lawyerly nature, which also need to be protected. The function, for example, of paralegals uh, and of community legal advocates. Now, there are many actors who do and must push back against the threats to independence. Let me just very briefly spell out some of the ways in which my own agency, the Fundamental Rights Agency, engages. There are four principal contexts. The first is through our survey work. We repeatedly survey the situation of human rights within the EU and a number of other states. And within that context, we repeatedly measure trust in the judicial system. In 2020, we surveyed the general population and of the EU 27, plus three additional states, and we asked them to what did they trust their judiciary, their judicial system. 27% uh, said no, they don't, that their judicial system is rarely or never independent. And when you disaggregate that by country, the figures are very varied. In one country uh, on this continent, 65% of people said they never or rarely trust the judicial system. Now, you can compare these figures uh, to the figures for a different question, the question of how important is it to have a trustworthy judicial system. And uh, when uh, Eurostat asked this question recently, 95% said that it is either essential or very important to have an independent judicial system. So we will continue this form of measurement to assist policymakers do their jobs. Second, through our research, 
we occasionally expose particular concentrations of threat to independence uh, in certain specific sectors. One of the most obvious right now, of course, is that of migration. The role of the lawyer in the entire migration pathway uh, through the first reception, uh, through registration, asylum applications, asylum appeals, and so on. The role of the lawyer is absolutely critical. But within the context of the current pressures uh, and migratory crises, uh, we see uh, 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 risks and threats to the independence of lawyers who are functioning in that context. Uh, we see their work being impeded in some places, the confidentiality of their work uh, being threatened. Uh, we see in some cases even that they're not only interfered with, uh, but they're prosecuted on what don't look like very convincing charges. Another area, another sector where we see a problem is in some countries with regard to the operation of the European arrest warrant. We've conducted research at the request of the European Commission and we've seen in a few locations a lack of confidence in the independence of uh, court and uh, administration appointed lawyers in the specific operation of the European arrest warrant, particularly in countries or contexts where there's an open list from which the authorities can choose any name they like rather than some kind of an automatic list uh, or in uh, contexts where there are very few lawyers available. And so here, uh, something we've been flagging recently that needs some attention. The third way, the third of the four ways in which we support the work for independence is, of course, our support to the administration of the rule of law tools of the European Commission. We, prov we provide information for the reports, but we also support the annual dialogues that the Commissioner spoke about just a moment ago. And fourth and finally, and I'd like to uh, uh, pull this out specifically, and that is our specific work around uh, human rights and artificial intelligence, which has been a major focus of our research and attention in recent years. And next year, we will publish a report specifically on the uh, issue of fundamental rights risks through the application of AI in the criminal justice system. So this will be a major report next year, uh, 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 which will comprehensively address the issues. But in the meantime, drawing on our existing work, let me just uh, uh, indicate a few headline issues. The first is we know from our work that the primary driver of AI is not quality, it's efficiency. There's nothing inherently wrong with that, but it does raise a red flag of caution uh, regarding uh, the, 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 the human rights-related outcomes that could uh, take place in a context where efficiency and speed uh, is the driver. Secondly, as we all know, uh, AI is driven by da data. And uh, Katerina Barley already this morning flagged the problems of the data, uh, of the extent of bias in AI technologies. Um, it's difficult to overstate the problem. We've been researching it in many, many different contexts and sectors. Uh, but the, um, uh, it's bad enough in English, but when you go to other languages, it gets worse and worse because the data sets get smaller and smaller and therefore the biases can get bigger and bigger. Uh, and so this really requires very close and concentrated attention, as does the extent of dirty data. That phrase refers to mistaken data. Uh, which again in various contexts we've researched and discovered present to a degree that we hadn't expected. I'm referring here to simply entering mistakes when the data is entered and then the mistakes um, through the technology, the, uh, the, the, the um, feedback loops, the mistakes getting ever bigger uh, as the te technology is further promoted. Still another, um, still another problem with the use of AI in any context, including in the judicial context, is the persistent resistance from industry to some essential requirements. One is that there be case and context specific testing of technology. Uh, there's still a resistance to the idea of use case testing uh, and, and the fact that the Testing needs to be done over time, not just the day the tech leaves the factory. But because of these, uh, these feedback loops, we have to keep ensuring that the quality is uh, at an acceptable degree. And still one other problem with industry uh, that's persistent is an unwillingness to share full information uh, on the algorithms. And how can we test the operation in any context if we don't know uh, what the algorithms look like? And so uh, I'm very glad that these are being addressed through the drafting of the AI Act. Uh, and that all applications of AI in the ju justice sector has already been flagged in the draft as high risk. I think that's highly appropriate. And then the final point I'll make about AI is a pr very prosaic one, but it needs to 
be said repeatedly, which is that as we invest in technology, we have to ensure respect for the principle of equality of arms. Uh, and we saw in the context of COVID that that was problematic. We saw cases where some lawyers had the tech, some didn't, some knew how to use it, some didn't, uh, and the rules for the application of the technology across uh, courtrooms varied enormously, even in the same jurisdictions. And so this is another, as I say, more prosaic but necessary element of going forward as we tackle these issues. But let me, let me leave it there, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's something you said that really caught my attention uh, when you um, went through the, 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 the risks. And it's um, the growth of autocratic states and the decline of democracy. Because I think it touches upon um, a core problem in what we actually are discussing. An independent profession is exactly a threat to these kind of authoritarian developments as journalists are, as uh, artists may be. There's something about independency and authoritarian development that clashes. And uh, there's another point that I would ask the panel to reflect upon a bit. Why is it so difficult to make the public at large understand the value of an independent legal profession and an independent and unbiased legal sector? It's like something um, invisible to the public at large and therefore perhaps it does not engage politicians to the degree uh, that we wish to, with a great exception of you. You are very well versed in these uh, um, uh, challenges and, and, and thoughts. But you um, also mentioned that you wanted training of young children. But it's, why don't we just start to train the public on the value of what we are speaking about? Anybody feel like commenting this larger perspective? Maybe briefly two or three comments. First about what I've listened many times also in this house, the fact that we have a, a real conflict that it's true between democracies and authoritarian regimes, but the development of more and more autocratic regimes. Well, I don't remember the period where China was really a democracy. I don't remember where we have had so many democracies around Israel in the Arab world, and I may continue because I was very involved in the other part of the world as foreign affairs minister. But the conflict is there, of course, and we need to see that uh, there is a reinforcement of the different capabilities of some authoritarian regimes on military side, uh, in the trade, in many different uh, other perspectives. And it's the reason why we need also to pay attention uh, to the evolution also around us, because if you look to the European Union, due to the enlargement of the European Union, it was very impressive to see the development of more and more democracies in Europe, because you remember, to the south and to the east, is due to the enlargement, uh, to the enlargement of NATO, that was possible not only to have security on the territory of the European Union, but also to implement democracies. But it's very important to take care of this, and hopefully, in many new democracies, if I may, like Spain, if I want to say, before the uh, enlargement and after, or others uh, in the eastern part, we need to pay attention to maintain the situation. It's the reason why we are working so much on the rule of law. But we need to take care about the fact that uh, I don't, I'm not sure that we have had an old period of the time where it was more democratic in the world, it was more uh, evident to have a real full respect for the rule of law and for fundamental rights. But we need to take care about the evolutions and certainly about the strongest uh, capabilities of some authoritarian regimes in the world because they are stronger now when we are speaking about China. Of course, it's very clear that China is stronger now than some decades ago. About the, va the values and the, the way to explain, when I was discussing about the uh, education 
uh, ministers is due to the fact that if we want to discuss with the entire society, it's very useful to start with the young generations and to start with uh, the children at school. But of course, you're right. We need to continue to try to convince many people. And to my last remark, it's about how it's difficult, you said, to uh, promote the values and to explain. But because when we have started to discuss about the uh, disciplinary regimes of the judges in Poland, for many people in Europe, is the problem of the judges, and maybe more the judges in Poland than the others. I know that in your profession it was an important issue, but for the general public, it seems to be so far. Why is so important? But if you have a more emotional problem concerning the values in relation with your personal situation, it's totally different when we have seen a new legislation in Hungary about the so-called protection of the children, and we are sure that there are some uh, discriminations due to the sexual orientation against the LGBTI community, we have seen immediately a reaction everywhere in Europe with demonstrations and also at the highest level in the European Council, we have seen reactions of 16 or 17 member states uh, to their leadership uh, just the day after the adoption. So we need to explain, it's true, that uh, there are fundamental rights. It's very easy to understand because it's in relation with your personal situation, but we need also to explain that an independent judge, it's very important to protect all the uh, individual rights. But it's more complex maybe uh, uh, to pass the message and the bar associations and all the professionals may have a role to, to do that. But just to, to comment about that. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I think it's a really interesting question you asked. And um, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, we do find a high level of expectation of fairness in the judicial system in our societies. So we're, we're, we're starting from a good place in terms of the openness uh, of communities and societies. Uh, but I think there's a very limited understanding of the diversity of the modern day legal profession. Uh, and perhaps the bar associations and, and other bodies uh, could do a job of educating their own societies about how this, this is not this, this fixed, idee fixed profession uh, that's locked in many people's minds. Uh, very closely related is the extent to which um, uh, uh, lawyers are doing the essential work of standing up for everybody in our society. Um, you know, we need to tell the story of the, the lawyer I met in a shed on a Greek island uh, who's doing totally unthanked, badly paid work, uh, which is absolutely essential. We need to tell the story of another lawyer I met in a back street uh, on the Belarus border, who's putting, uh, putting his career at risk because he's doing something deeply unpopular in, in, in his country. So uh, this, the, the story needs to get told. Um, uh, and um, by the way, there's a, clo a, complete, a very closely related issue, I won't get into it, but I just want to mention it, which is you could have asked exactly the same question about human rights. Uh, why does human rights not seem to get people excited on our streets anymore? And I could give an answer to that, but you didn't ask that question, so I won't. Uh, but, um, but they're, they're, but they're, not, un, they're not unrelated. What an exaggerated respect. <laughs> well, I'm still getting my own back on you for describing me as being on your extreme right, <laughs> which is a manner in which I've never been described before. <laughs> Well, j j just questions uh, about uh, the problems uh, in order just to face the attacks against rule of law right now. Probably uh, in order just to face that, uh, the problem is that we are seeing how rule of law is attacked not in a frontal way, not abolishing uh, democracies, but uh, within the democracies and trying to trick everybody trying to, to, to arrive to places where rule of law is not respected, but not formally, but uh, insubstantial. And this is something which not uh, all people can detect, uh, and that's probably why um, Mr. Renders talk about uh, education. Uh, people has to know, have to know uh, how to detect when rule of law is at, is at stake. Uh, and secondly, talking about the difference between uh, how people normally knows about the importance of the independence of judiciary, and this is not the same for the lawyer as a profession. Uh, it's true that not always people are so concerned about uh, uh, the independence of judiciary, even being judiciary one of the three powers of the state. I mean, it's not that this is just to 
be very uh, well uh, be very aware about that the risk for modern societies comes not only by uh, touching the three powers of the state but all the powers so we're talking about lawyers for sure we're talking about journalists as well we said beforehand that we are just negotiating a slap directive which is a, a kind of um, legislation which tries to defend mostly journalists but uh, NGOs and why not uh, lawyers as well when they are attacked by abusive claims in civil uh, uh, in civil courts uh, in order just to uh, try to avoid uh, any people saying something different about uh, the strategic topic so I guess that in the importance provided by the public to the independence of lawyers is not the same as the judiciary, but we have to reflect on that and to try to, uh, one, once more time, educate people in order just to be aware about these risks as well. But that's a very important point you are making, that the judiciary and the division of state power, you know, it's not exactly the same thing. You know, the, uh, uh, there's... Um, in the, in the theory of division of state power, it's a checks and balance yeah, sure. uh, um, purpose to the legislative and the executive powers. But the judiciary at large consists of many components. And I think the public often think of it, oh, uh, the courts, the judges, and they have high regard in society. But in fact, it is, in criminal cases, also prosecutors, the police force. Are they abusive or do they stick to the rules? <coughs> Lawyers, we help the courts in making right decisions by giving arguments, by opposing uh, the, 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 the standards of law, uh, showing the perspective of individuals, and this kind of impact of the legal profession, I think is very important for the trust of the judiciary at large. And I'm getting back to you on the joke about criminal lawyers, because we know that politicians are the backbone of our democracy. And when politicians are always being made fun of, and as we've seen in the United States, that uh, the accusations of criminal behavior carrying out political duties. It's very damaging to the trust to our institutions in societies at, at large. Not saying there's criminal politicians, there's criminal lawyers, but this is not the institutions we are speaking about. I would like to open up for any questions, and then I see hands raising, that's wonderful. The lady here to my left, and then I see you, not to the far right, but to the upper right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Hello. Can I start? I can only do two other times. I'm the one. Please. Good morning, and thank you very much for this nice discussion. We are the Portuguese delegation. And I would ask you something. Uh, normally, you talk about uh, democracies that we know are not democracies and that live within us. We talk about the example of Poland, we talk uh, the example of Hungary, which have mixed feelings regarding democracy and the independence of judges is now in place. But what about other countries? You talked about, for example, young democracies like our own. We have 50-year democracy and there is no doubt that we have democracy. However, there is sad, uh, some, some issues with the democracies that maybe are not well known. For example, you talked about the recovery and resilience facility for our country, and we have one. And one of the things that's being made today regarding this resilience and uh, resilience facility is that some... some government ruling is being made and with the parliament to, uh, that endangers the bar independence and endangers also lawyers independence. For example, uh, 15 years ago more or less, 
uh, it, a bill was approved in our parliament that stops, for example, the bar to be able to examine trainees into the profession. This is very dangerous to the independence of lawyers. Uh, now, it, we will be the first bar in Europe that will not have an exam to, 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 to see if the trainees are trained properly to exercise the profession. And according to our government and to our parliament, this is due to the resilience plan. So it's being imposed by Europe. And so we have questions about this. I yeah, should ask and I you. I think I will have to. Can you formulate your question? We have to have short yes. questions. What I would if... ask you is: Are we really fighting for an independence of the bars and of the lawyers, or are we, uh, uh, in a way, caving in to 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 to, to economic power and to to to, to money power? Because. She, you are absolutely right. The impression that people have about lawyers is the worst. And so they keep adding uh, difficulties to our independence, which endanger the public. And I'm very concerned about this. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to, uh, uh, just for, uh, to be explained if this was a measure that was imposed on the Portuguese government, for example. Yes, please. No, f first a remark, because uh, I know that there are many comments also in this House when I'm in the plenary about uh, lack of democracy or the absence of democracies, and you mentioned yourself, Hungary and Poland. You know maybe that we have just had elections in Poland. Yes. Yeah. And maybe we'll have a change in Poland. Yes. So I'm sure that we have... Yes, but it's due to the fact that we have a democracy in Poland. Also in the last years, it was maybe with some deviations, and we have said that many times in the rule of law report. We have engaged procedure before the Court of Justice. We have pushed pressure with uh, the budgetary tools that we have. But we have said during all the, this period that it was maybe also possible for the citizens to change the situation through the vote. And it's the case now. So Please, we need to take care about uh, the fact that we are going sometimes too far in the comments, saying because there are some breaches to the rule of law, there are some violations of the human rights, there is no democracy. The example of Poland is very clear. We have had elections and there is a real change with a democratic process. In Hungary, in the last election, we have said, like others, uh, we have had uh, free elections in Hungary, not fair. That's something very precise we have decided. And about the recovery and resilience plan, be sure that in all the plans what we try to do is to uh, develop the independence of the justice system, so to promote that, to ask to invest in the justice system. And I will pay attention to what you have said about the training, but we are for the training in all the different professions of the justice system. So I will pay attention about your remarks, but I don't have the precise answer about a detail, but I will send to you maybe a precise answer. But we try to develop the training also in, co in cooperation with the bar associations for the lawyers. So we'll see, but uh, I'm sure that uh, we, we will continue to do that, to find, to have a real training of all the professionals. Thank you so much. Uh, there were so many hands up, and I, um, uh, you on the upper row, I would just, we only have 10 minutes left, and I hope we can have a few more questions. Well, Keep questions them together. very short and um, precise, please. Thank you very much. I'm afraid my question is for Commissioner Reinders, too. My name is Peter Callens. I'm the president of the Order of Flemish Bars, Orde van Vlaamse Balies. Um, I was very flattered, and um, uh, I thought it was very good that you mentioned uh, the, the judgment that was handed down by the European Court of Justice on the 8th of December last year, which is a fundamental one for the independence of the, of the legal profession, but especially also for the confidentiality. Um, but my, my point is that um, my impression is, and maybe it's shared by others here in this room, is that more and more we have to rely on the courts to support the values of the profession, be it the constitutional courts in the national uh, at the national level, be it the European Court in Luxembourg or the European Court of Human Rights in, in Strasbourg. But we're relying on judges. We're less and less relying on um, the legislators and less and less on the executive. And I think that's problematic. And um, the, the, the symptom uh, that I see, and that's my question, I'm coming to it, um, is the following. Um, we pleaded 
of course, in favour of the position of the legal profession and the court gave ju judgment in our favour, which is good. But why was the European Commission pleading against us? They pleaded against our thesis. I think it would be nice if, when it comes to defending the fundamentals of the legal profession and the rule of law, that also the executive takes a position which is in, which is in favor of the legal profession. We're not here to defend our own, um, we're not here to defend our own privileges. We're here to do something which is in favor of the general public and which is a cornerstone of the democracy. Thank you. Now, again, I've said at the end, we uh, try to make the difference between the different uh, situations that we have. And we have had the discussion during the uh, uh, discussion with all the stakeholders in, the, uh, uh, Belgium, in Belgium about the rule of law report. Of course, if it's a right to defend some uh, body, uh, we are on your side to say that it's possible to have all the different rules uh, into place to protect the independence of the lawyers. I know that we have more discussions when uh, it's coming to uh, money laundering or I said the sanctions about Russia because there, if it's a right to defend, no problem, and we'll continue to do that. If it's with a real risk to take part in a criminal offense, that is something else. That's the first discussion that we need to have. And we have had discussions about, I know, money laundering. It's more in charge of some colleagues, but I'm also in the Commission, so I don't have any problem to discuss about that because I have the same discussion now with the Parliament and the Council about the, uh, the proposal of directive that they've put on the table about the sanctions against Russia. Uh, there, it's very clear that it's possible for the lawyers uh, to uh, defend different possible oligarchs because uh, they have some rights to say, no, we don't want to be on the list of the sanctions. And you know, we have lost some cases before the Court of Justice. We have won also some cases before the Court of Justice. But if it's to give an advice to organize the convention, it's something else. And we have said also there that we are very strict on this. And so in the uh, presentation of the Commission before the Court, it's also that. What are the cases where it's possible to be on your side when, because there is a real uh, participation in the right to defence, when is it possible to ask maybe some exceptions due to uh, the participation in the uh, organize, organized crime or in different situations uh, to, put, to put into place to commit a crime? I want just to add that we have discussed that too. My main concern for the moment is maybe more the fact that there are no uh, implementation of the decision of the Court of Justice. It's possible to have a different position before the Court, but when the, when the decision is there, we need to implement. It's a binding decision. And you know that for the first time we have put in our report uh, a mention about the non-implemented uh, decision of the U Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, in all the member states. And I take the opportunity to say so here that I will be very pleased with the national parliament and the bar associations to do the same at the national level. What are, how many decisions are not implemented at the national level by the authorities? Because it's quite useful to have independent, qualified and efficient justice systems, but without implementation of the decisions, it's a problem. So it's not so much a problem to have different views before the court. The problem is to be sure that when there is a binding decision of the court, we are going to a correct implementation. And for the moment, we try to do that with the ECGs, our role in the Commission, we have put a mention in our report about the European Court of Human Rights, but I will be very pleased to work with you and with the national parliaments about the same situation at the national level, because it's the last element, of course, of the justice system. If the decisions are not executed, of course we have a problem of uh, justice system functioning. I think you have uh, triggered an idea for uh, uh, an extensive seminar on implementation of client lawyer confidentiality. Uh, but uh, <laughs> David, you wanted to make a, a quick comment. Yes, uh, just a few words uh, reacting both questions. I mean, that the court solve things is not a bad symptom in itself. I mean, at the, on the contrary, it's, it's the result of uh, having something against the rule of law. I, I was just reading the last uh, uh, report of the Commission about rule of law, uh, which says the Constitutional Court was called in Portugal to rule on the impact of the draft law on professional associations on the independence of lawyers, which is found compatible with the Constitution. 
check and balance, discussions, different views, and at the very end, the courts will decide if really uh, somebody sh should have uh, the reason in this case, and after we have to execute it. This discussion is just the contrary of uh, having uh, something uh, against rule of law. I think that this is a symptom of exactly the, 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 the opposite. We will slightly postpone um, the coffee break. So I will allow one or possibly two more questions. The lady in front of me, please. Thank you very much. I'm the head of the health program of the Council of Europe. And thanks for mentioning Council of Europe. I think it's, it's a one minute uh, pledge and comment. So it's, uh, it was a big success since 2015, covering both Council of Europe and European Union standards and legislation. We grew exponentially, not only during uh, COVID times, but now when war is uh, ravaging Europe, we have seen, for instance, the number of Ukrainians doubling and taking uh, a look at the standards of the European Union and of the Council of Europe. And we, in, when we see the users of, uh, of the platform, the majority of them are lawyers. And thank you, CCB, and all the bars, including the Spanish uh, bar, because Spain is holding the presidency, of this spread. And I think on education, we need to target. We cannot go uh, for at all society, but for instance, we are seeing a lot of interest of law students in taking these online courses, and I can guarantee we have at least one million hours spent by uh, Europeans learning about the standards. So I think that we do not need to uh, train all the population. When people need a lawyer, they know and they go, but we need to train well the European legal community, which to my knowledge, they don't know well uh, European uh, standards, European law, or many of the things we are discussing here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I regard that as an intervention, not a question. There's a gentleman right behind you. Uh, please go ahead. What's your question? Yeah. Hello, Chairman and dear panelists. I'm an attorney from Turkey, a member of Brussels Bar and also Istanbul Bar. Um, I have done a lot of work in Europe with many colleagues in domestic countries, from Portugal to Germany, Belgium, and uh, I have done so many works, more than 30 countries. And I'm not proud of, uh, to be uh, with the quality of the justice in Turkey or the, um, the rule of law in Turkey, but um, I can be really proud with the digitalization of the process, facilitation of the access to justice is, is very, uh, you know, uh, uh, extensive and also, uh, how do you say, developed and also the uh, forced mediation has been introduced in Turkey uh, more than four or five years ago, and now 90% of the cases has to go to forced mediation. And the forced mediation now, you know, upholds the role of the lawyers, because if the 99% of the mediators are the uh, lawyers now, and also they can have both roles, like the a representative for the plaintiff or defendant, or the disputed parties, and it's also a arbitrator, depending on what role she, she is in or he is in. Now we can see the, uh, the tendency in West, uh, as my colleague uh, now emphasizes that, leaving the uh, justice to the courts solely, I can see in many countries here, not to the lawyers. Now in Turkey, we can handle these issues. If it's not against the public order, we can even administrative issues like migration issues or any uh, small uh, criminal issues now can go to mediation. And the mediation, in the, uh, everything can be solved uh, confidentially, effectively, uh, without time and money consuming. That I can, I still observe, I am doing mediator right from here uh, through teleconference sometimes. And I have a, another meeting tomorrow. So I can see uh, the role of the lawyers in Turkey have been really increased through the forced mediation, but I couldn't see the mediation implemented even in, in Belgium. There is mediation, but not forced mediation. Uh, so in other countries, I didn't see. In Portugal, I didn't see. So I think the mediation can, can have a, a lot of impact on the independent or the increasing the role of the lawyer in justice system. Thank you.
Thank you so much. I will allow one more question. The gentleman up. Yeah, thank you. My name is Emmanuel Plascart. I'm one of the presidents of the, the Brussels Bar. Uh, we were discussing the execution or the enforcement of court decisions. And we have an issue here in, in, in Belgium and especially in Brussels and maybe in other countries. Uh, I, I'm speaking about the, the crisis of the refugees. We have thousands and thousands of decisions uh, of national Belgian courts, including of the European Court of Human Rights, which are not enforced by a government. So my, my question is simply, are, are there some initiatives uh, which are considered at European level uh, not well, maybe to force or at least to incite our governments to comply with the court decisions rendered in this case, but also in other cases. Thank you. No, I'd like to I, I, respond to this too. I want just first to repeat that uh, we have started uh, in the 2022 report, if I, if I remember, uh, to uh, indicate uh, the lack of um, execution of all the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights. It's the first element to say to all the member states that uh, there is a real problem, a real issue there, because for the Court of Justice, we are in charge at the Commission level uh, to force the uh, execution. So I will say for the European Court of Human Rights, uh, it's the role of the Committee of Ministers in the Council of Europe to do that. The Parliament may take some initiative, but at the end, it's the role of the Committee of Ministers. And I was, again, one or two weeks ago, in Strasbourg for the Council of Europe, I have seen all the different ambassadors, and I repeat that it's very important to engage different procedures when there is a lack of uh, execution of the uh, decision of the European Court of, of Human Rights, because, uh, again, it's a problem for efficiency uh, of the justice system. If you don't have any execution, it's a real issue. And so we'll continue to do that, of course, and to, to ask to the member state to pay attention to the decision of the court, European, European Court of Human Rights. But I want to, to develop for the next year the same kind of uh, approach with the national bar associations and with the national parliaments about the national decisions. And is one of the cases that you mentioned, of course, if they are it's the same decisions, eh? but if there are many decisions that are not executed, it's very important to push pressure on the government to, uh, to do that. But more than that, when there is a decision explaining that, like you have had in Belgium, it's very important to don't have any declaration from the authorities saying we don't want to apply or to execute the decision. And I've reacted. It was my, the country that I know the best, like we are saying the Commission, but I've said that myself. It's impossible to listen to her, to have heard a minister or member of a government saying we don't want to execute a decision of the justice system. There are different possibilities to go to appeal in some case or to go to uh, the end of the procedure, but when you have a binding decision, you need to apply. That is very clear. About the enforcement, uh, we don't have the same capacity. You know that about the discipline regime of the judge in Poland, Without an, implement, an execution of the binding decision of the court by Poland, I have asked to the Commission to go back to the court and we have imported a fine of 1 million euro per day to Poland. And now we'll see with, I said, the elections, it may be easier to find a way to solve the issue. But no, you're right. It's very important not only to have a correct execution, but to don't have so many declarations in different member states coming from uh, politicians or for other people against the decision of the judges. If you are against the decision of the judge, you have some possibilities to go to appeal, but at the end, you need to execute the final decision. So we'll continue to work on this, but I have proposed in the meeting that we have had uh, in Brussels to see how it's possible to collect that, because I need to confess that in the Commission, I don't have the capacity to control the execution of all the national decisions, but I'm sure that with the bar associations and the national parliament, it must be possible to do that. Thank you. Um, before I close, I would like to give our panelists a chance to have the sort of last word. Are you ready to give a, a, a short appeal on how we should move forward? Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I want to react to a couple of things. Uh, first, with regard to the non-implementation of the migration judgments, we are capturing this and reporting it every year in the Fundamental Rights Report, which the agency publishes. So uh, we're, su we're supporting the effort towards implementation by drawing attention uh, through this device. Secondly, uh, there was so much talk about Hungary and Poland, and I, I, I don't contradict any of it, but it's really important to leave this room with a sense that we've got problems everywhere. 
there's a risk by naming one or two countries that we somehow say, and I'm fine, or my country is fine. That's not the case. And uh, uh, I gave you a list of challenges to independence. Uh, you'll find some element of some one or two of those in every single country represented in this room. Of that, I have no doubt. Um, maybe the last thing I want to say is that I really welcome the discussion because um, I have a feeling that it's... It, it, the lived reality of the threats to independence and the extent to which it's prevalent everywhere uh, and the manner by which we've forgotten the norms and the standards that were developed decades ago is, has been overlooked. It needs attention right now. So I don't know whether new standards will emerge. We have the Council of Europe instrument, of course, the emerging one, uh, but, but getting this debate alive and getting it out into the public uh, would, I think, be very important indeed. I fully agree with, with Michael and everything. I mean, problems are everywhere. And uh, this is a very interesting topic, and uh, it must be alive the uh, whole time. And I'm just really desiring to have a very good su success uh, in the draft convention, uh, the Council of, of Europe, in order just to accommodate the concerns we, he we heard we during the day. So these are my final remarks. Thank you. No, it's, I want to insist on what uh, Michael said. We, we try with the rule of law report uh, to make a presentation of the 27 member states. And we are sending recommendations to the 27 member states. We are discussing that in the Council. I want to pay tribute to the Council because uh, uh, it's possible every six months to have a discussion on five member states. And we have concluded the first round on the 27th, and we are engaged in the second round already. Uh, it's true that uh, with many other actors, also in the European Parliament, uh, sometimes with the press, uh, it seems to be better to discuss all the time about the same usual suspect than to engage on the national situation. And when I'm going to a national parliament, I've seen that I receive in all the member states more questions about the usual suspect than about the national situation. And there are problems everywhere. Mm -hmm. And we will extend now the report to some accession countries in the same way, to show what are the possible concerns. But again, when we discuss about the non-execution of the uh, uh, justice decisions, or when we discuss about the non-implementation of one of our recommendations, it's very difficult to engage a real debate at the national level uh, with the, the parliament or with different national parliament or with different authorities because everybody prefer to speak about Poland, Hungary or the situation elsewhere. And I ask all the time just to pay attention maybe 15 minutes on the national situation. So thanks for the remark, Michael. We try to do that. We try to come out. And I thank you if it's possible in your different uh, countries to organize such a debate on national recommendations with all the people around the table. So the stakeholders are not only civil society organizations by association, but also the authorities. And again, about the non-execution of some uh, the just, the justice decisions, it's very important to our, and we are open to take part in the discussion and to put around the table all the partners. Because that's the most important element, to show that there are possible improvement in all the member states, but it's true that we have more systemic issues in some and we have huge reforms to do in some accession countries. That's very good advice, and I uh, would like to thank my very competent um, panelists and a very engaged audience. This panel is over. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Barrett, also for moderating this session. We will have now a coffee break, uh, so we will come back at 11... Uh, 15 past 11. <laughs>